And, you know, this idea that he loved us and he gave his blood for us is so deeply rooted in, in the Jewish faith, but also in our Christian faith, because it's about forgiveness. How many recognize that you're a sinner and that you've been saved by your works? No. What were you saved by? The grace of God. Did you deserve to be saved? Is there anything you could have done to get saved? Because the sin that we were born with had a death sentence on our life, right? So and that's not a new concept in the Old Testament either. They, you know, when once Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God made provisions, and they're called covenants, right? Because how many know he loves to be with us? Adam and Eve in the garden had fellowship, un, unfettered fellowship. Isn't that awesome? And you say, why would they do anything to interrupt that? But they did. They disobeyed, and they sinned. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's the next one that I have up there is um, these five ideas that I want you to think about as we're talking about this today. Because I can tell you there's 10 messages on, on this topic easily, and we only have one day today for, for me to talk, so I'm going to try to condense it down to what I really want to say. And it's about the blood covenant and about how we can live in such appreciation for what the Lord has done for us when we're thinking about this. So it says covenant is what? Stronger than a, than a contract. Both are enforceable by law, but contracts are often broken and covenants are not. So that's a big difference, isn't it? Because when you're in a business situation and somebody on the other side just t decides to rip up your contract because they found a loophole in it, uh, you, sometimes you could be out of out of a lot of money. But when God makes a covenant, he says, no, my life is in on this now, and I'm not backing down on my side of it. This is a blood covenant. And you can think about in the garden, right, when Adam and Eve were there, and they sinned, what was the first thing that God did? He covered them with what? An animal skin. How did he get the animal skin? But there was no death in the garden prior to their sin. And that's one of the ways the devil lied to Adam and Eve and said, oh, you won't die. If you eat from that tree, how many think it was an apple? I'm going to, you know, you can tell by the way I ask, I'm going to challenge that view today. I'm not going to tell you what I think it was yet, but you'll see a picture in a little while. So it doesn't matter what the fruit was in this context, but once they ate it, they didn't die, but they brought death into the kingdom and they eventually did die. And then the first two children that were born of man, Cain and Abel, murder. See how they brought death right in? Because you could say Adam and Eve weren't even the first natural born because they were born directly from God. But the first two brothers, there was murder right there. So the devil's such a liar. They didn't die immediately when they ate it, but they brought death in. And the first thing God did was say, you know what? I'm going to provi provide a substitute for you. Something else is going to die instead of you. And that was that animal to cover them. But it wasn't just the animal that covered them because then you had also when Abraham was supposed to sacrifice his son Isaac, right? What did God do? He provided a ram. So there was another prophetic picture of God saying, you know, your sin uh, is enough for me to take your life, but I'm going to use a substitutionary sacrifice for you, and it's going to be a ram. It's going to be a male lamb. Well, you know, we know about the lamb, but it was specifically a ram in the case of Abraham. And how about when they were in the wilderness tabernacle? We've been talking about that on Tuesday nights when I did the class on the tabernacle of David. And, you know, there's these connection points. So God has perfect connection with Adam and Eve in the garden, but then it's broken and they're kicked out of the garden. They're evicted. But he still wants to be with them. So he makes a covenant with Abram. Abram at the time, right? And then he changes his name to Abraham, and he tells him over the time of Genesis to Exodus that I'm going to be with you again, and I want you to build a tabernacle for me. We're going to talk about that a little. And you're going to bring the blood into the Holy of Holies, and you're going to sprinkle the blood for the forgiveness of the people on the Day of Atonement. Remember this? All foreshadowing. Solomon's temple, same thing. Sacrifice, thousands of animals. And then we have what Jesus did for us, which is why there's red and white up here on the cross, because of his blood, but his resurrection. Amen. And we're walking in the resurrection. Aren't you glad you're in the dispensation of the resurrection? He said, it's actually a good thing that I go, because if I go, then I could send Holy Spirit. And instead of you having to come to the temple, you're going to be the temple. The Spirit of God's going to live inside of you. And I'm putting the blood on the mercy seat of your heart. Woo! I'm happy about that. I hope you are too. In Hebrews it says, He is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. Again, why does God want to spend so much time with us? Because He loves us. 
but sin separates. So without a buffer, without something to, to make it okay for us to stand in his presence, we would still be far away from God. So I think taking communion every morning is a really good habit to be in. Start your day on your knees praying and take communion and say, Lord, I'm going to eat three other meals today, but I want this to be the first meal of the day. All right. It was a meal that got us in trouble, pulled food off a tree and they ate something. It was a meal that he gave us to heal. Isn't that cool? So take that meal in the morning. You don't know what landmines the devil's trying to put out in front of you before you go out the door in the morning. You can say, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. Open my eyes to all the landmines. I'm sanctifying my body to you by having this meal before I even start my day. I'm starting it with you. Amen. It's really easy to do. All right? So this says he's a mediator of a new covenant between God and people. Now, when someone leaves a will, we read this during communion, it's necessary to prove that the person who made it is what? is dead, right? But listen, this is not a contract. When somebody leaves a will, that's a covenant. After they're gone, it's enforceable by law that however they wrote that thing, as long as they were of sound mind, right, that it has to be done according to their wishes. That's a covenant. That's different than a contract. And then that will goes into effect after the person's death. And when the person who made it is still alive, it can't be put into effect. And that's why even the first covenant, whether you look at Adam and Eve or you look at Abram, they were what? First covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. There had to be a death in order for the covenant to be fulfilled. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, come on, there's no forgiveness of sin. How many have been forgiven of your sin? And, and it's because of the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, the devil hates it in the, in the deliverance room. He hates the topic of the blood of the lamb. So nobody wants to talk about it anymore. Well, too bad, because we're talking about it, devil, because you've been defeated. The accuser has been cast down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and not loving their life even unto death. Is there spiritual warfare? You bet. But I'm not going to be on the sidelines. I'm being in the war. All right, so this is so good. Hebrews 8 again. I'm not going to read a ton of scripture today, but I just want you to see this is New Testament now reflecting back on the symbolism in the old. Hebrews 8 says the priests on the earth serve in a temple that is what? But a, a copy modeled after the heavenly sanctuary. So if you've read Exodus, if you're any kind of Bible scholar, you say there's chapter after chapter, detail after detail of how God wanted Moses to build the tabernacle. Remember now, it's in this context that God had relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. Then it was separated by sin. And he said, you know what? I'm going to have you build a tabernacle so my presence can dwell in your midst. And every time you set camp, this is going to be right in the middle of the camp. And my presence is going to dwell in there. Very specifically, it's going to dwell in the Holy of Holies in between the angel's wings in a place called the mercy seat. That's where the light is going to emanate from there. And I want you to come in there and sprinkle blood and incense in there that reminds me of the sacrifice of why I can extend grace to you. Right? Because we didn't earn the grace. But how many are glad you have it? Number five, right? Number of grace. Whew. For when Moses began to construct the tabernacle, God warned him and said, you must precisely follow the pattern that I revealed to you. Now, I was reading a commentary about this, and this commentator thought that Moses was taken up right into heaven, right into the throne room. When it says that he revealed it to Moses, it was because Moses saw it firsthand. There are many people in the Bible that describe being in the throne room, right? Isaiah said, I saw the Lord and I fell down like a dead man. Ezekiel, John in the book of Revelation. So why not Moses? Instead of just describing it, I'll let you see it, Moses. And he was building what he saw when he was taken up into heaven, according to this man. And I think it's got some legs on it, that idea. Right? Construct a tabernacle. You must precisely follow the pattern I reveal to you on Mount Sinai. But now Jesus, the Messiah, has accepted a priestly ministry. He's our high priest, right? Where is he right now? Seated at the right hand of who? The Father. The Father is the one who sits on the throne. And then unto the Lamb. Remember that song we used to sing? To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Jesus is seated, seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and, and this is this role that he has now. He, um, Jesus the Messiah has accepted a priestly ministry which, which far surpasses the earthly priests. 
since he's the catalyst of a better covenant which contains far more wonderful promises than the promise of the tabernacle covenant because the priest had to come in every year. And you were always at risk of not being forgiven. How about now? You're not at risk. If you ask the Lord to forgive you, this is the energizer bunny. He never runs out of energy. He's always there for you. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He who watches Israel, right, is there for you whenever you need him. He's never closed for business. You need forgiveness? He is faithful and just. You confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all iniquity. And then I got this picture as I was preparing. I don't know if it looks like a bad acid trip to you on this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you, know, you let me know later. And I'm happy to send these slides. Because the picture was they were in this beautiful garden right on the left-hand side, and, and they had this awesome relationship with God. And why I want you to keep thinking about that is because that's what we're going to have in the future. When he comes back for the second return, we're not getting taken up and out. We're coming back and ruling and reigning with him. That's called the new Jerusalem. All right, we're going to spend eternity with the same power that Adam and Eve had, the same unfettered fellowship, and it's not just sitting on a cloud playing a harp. We're going to be really busy people. We're going to be activated. And, and there's even a verse in 1 Corinthians 15 that says everything you're doing here is counting towards that future. So the way you live your life really matters. It's not just waiting to get taken out of here, like beam me up, Scotty. Remember that from Star Trek? No, keep me here. Keep me active. Keep me busy. I want to occupy until you come back. So he had that with them in the garden. He brings Moses up into heaven and says, build this, and I'm going to have you put this in the middle of the camp, and, and this is what I want right in the holiest of all. I want you to put this Ark of the Covenant. And anybody remember what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Just yell it out. I'm sure you're right, because you're all yelling good stuff out, right? <laughs> the tablets, the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, right? All the things that reminded them of the miracles of God. How about you? Do you need to do that to yourself? Yes. You need to remind yourself of how God saved you. You might not be where you want to be, but you're not where you were. How many? True? He brought you a mighty long way. If you're really honest, he brought you a mighty long way from where you were. And you still, and I still, have a mighty long way to go. Just ask Trisha, she'll tell you. About me, not about her. <laughs> this mercy seat, oh, it's so powerful because it's an empty place. And when my friend Daniel Amsutz was here, I don't know if anybody of you caught this, but we have a, a video up on our Facebook and our uh, website and our YouTube channel. And he said that, he got a picture of when Mary goes to the tomb and it's empty. She walks in and there's two angels. And where are they? At either end of where his body was, right? So isn't that a picture like this? And that in that empty place, God will meet you. So it was another form of tying us back to Scripture and saying, it's, he's alive. You need mercy? Come to the mercy seat right now, today. You got an empty place that nothing could seem to fill? I'm going to fill it for you. All right, so uh, here let me read from Genesis 3 because I just love this analogy. It says, in Genesis 3, 17, he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall spring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. That's, that's not a very happy verse, is it? I remember uh, a, a pastor saying that, he, he told this kind of a story in the Bible, and out of the crowd, there was a little four-year-old boy in the crowd. It was real quiet, and he said, well, that's not a very nice story, Dad. <laughs> and the whole place could hear him, right? So you're like, ah, oh, man, what a shame. There's tension in the Bible. They fell, and all of a sudden, there's this curse being spoken forth. And why am I bringing it up is because I just, I just love, you know, the humanity of Jesus that's represented here. He said, you know what? Yes, the, the flesh has been... Uh, perverted. It's been tainted by sin, but I'm going to come and be in the flesh. And I'm going to show you what it's like to live a sinless life. So again, I'm sorry if you've heard me say this, but I just think it bears repeating. Just picture that there's dirt down here, right? And God speaks to the dirt and tells it to rise up. And that's Adam. 
So that's what we were made from. Eve was made from Adam, so ladies, you are more highly refined. The men are mudheads. And then after I said that, a guy came up to me and said, yeah, but he, she was made out of a bone, so can I call her a bonehead? And I said, no, you, can, you better not say that. That violates the happy wife, happy life rule. <laughs> but we're, we're made out of dirt, right? So from dirt we were taken, and now to dirt you're going to return again. So then Jesus lives. He's made of that same flesh. He's made of that dirt, that sanctified dirt that had life in it, but that was going to die without the resurrection power, and he lives his whole 33 years without sin, right? Had anybody else ever done that before? Never done that before. And then he's on the cross, and he says, it is finished. And then he goes, and this was a great scene at the Jesus movie, yesterday, uh, Jesus play yesterday too. He's in the tomb, and all of a sudden they put a window in the tomb for you, and you see when the light comes down from heaven and springs into his dead body, and he springs up to life. Oh, man, that was powerful. But how did God do it initially? He breathed on the dirt, right, to create Adam. And now you're just seeing God breathing in that tomb into the dead flesh of Jesus and repeating what happened in Genesis. Only this time Jesus comes to life and never sins. So that's what we have access to. When you accept Jesus as your Lord, you're, you're walking with the perfect man. You're yoking yourself up to what we should have had all along with Adam. And that's who I want to be with. So if there's things in my life that are slowing me down from doing that, they're, they're leaving. Because I have a higher standard now that I can live with the perfect one. I can yoke myself to the perfect one, not some slave master mammon guy that's never going to be satisfied and never going to be happy. All right, so you're with me. I'm glad because I thought maybe this was getting a little out there. All right, so here's my big revelation. I think it was grapes, not an apple. And, and the reason people say apple, I don't know why, but it goes back, yeah, Adam's apple, but that's all made up later, right? It's like you think of grapes, you don't think of a tree, right? You think of a vine. But this is a real, this is a postcard actually from California of a real grapevine that looks like a tree to me. Like this could have been in the middle of the garden that God said, don't touch it, because grapes are everywhere. Wine is everywhere in the Bible. Take in this cup, let this cup pass from me, right? Like, and then you think about, she goes up and she picks the grape off and then eats it, and they sin, and then he comes back, and he says, you know what? I'm going to be pinned back up on a tree. And it's like a reversal of what happened at the, at the beginning. Now he's getting pinned back up as if he's the fruit getting pinned back up. I'm going to close the cycle. I'm going to close the loop. And then what do they offer him? Sour wine. Right back to the grape again. It's everywhere you look. And then the blood... When he, when he held up the cup at the dinner, he said, this is the cup of my blood. It was wine. So I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll think about that. And you, you tell me what you think as, as you dwell on it. I love this one, too. Um, you go to the next one, okay? That's the picture of um, uh, just an artist of what Adam might have looked like when he was being formed. And, uh, and coming out of the mercy seat that I, that I um, referenced before. And uh, it says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And a vessel of full, full of sour wine was sitting there. And they filled a sponge with the sour wine. They put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, come on, say it. It is finished. What's finished? This death cycle is over. I made it, 33 years, no sin. You can be free because I'm going to raise again from the dead. And my risen life is going to be a representation that you could tap into with my life. That wasn't the only thing that was finished, but that was one of the things. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, and he identified with Adam as the second Adam. And then, I, as I said earlier, what Daniel referenced, I, I love this, that in, in this play yesterday, they showed it this way, too. There was this tomb, and the, the stones rolled away, and she's all panicked because she thinks somebody stole the body. She goes in, and she sees these two angels. And then, you know what, but you go to the next one. The picture that I got was like what I said, that the mercy seat was right in the middle of where those two angels were. And then the Lord started showing me other pictures that reminded me. Can you go to the next one, please? Right? Like any time two things are in the middle of God and man, of that meeting place, there's the mercy seat. Right? It was in the tabernacle, 
And Moses had to sprinkle the blood there because that's where God said, it's where I'll meet you. But now that we're in this New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit. He's with us. We run into a situation. If we're willing to put ourselves in the situation, he says the mercy seat sits between where you are with my presence and where that hurting person is. And I'll come right between you. And, and the, the picture that he showed me was the next one, if you go there, is, is this right here. Do you see the similarity between the pictures? So the two angels are leaning in. But when Jesus was standing, he and Peter could have been leaning in. And all of a sudden now, God says, I'm going to bow down and wash your feet. And in that place of emptiness where you don't know me, I'm going to touch you where you need the help. And, and that's mercy because we didn't deserve it, did we? And that's half the problem people have. They don't even think they deserve God's love. And it's like, I've never been loved in my whole life, so why would he love me? Well, just accept it by faith. Can you say it with me? He loves me. He loves me unconditionally. Not for anything I've done, but for who I am. I'm his son or I'm his daughter. And he loves me unconditionally. And then I even thought, this picture too. Right? Because that's God stretching down and reaching his hand out to Adam. He didn't deserve it. We don't deserve to be touched by God. We're not holy. He is. But yet he says, you know what? I'm going to extend mercy to you. That's it for my creativity. <laughs> All right, John 20. We're back in the garden with Mary Magdalene. And it says, then she turned around to leave, and there was Jesus standing in front of her. But she didn't realize it was him. He said to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Mary answered and said, thinking he was only the gardener. Do you find that ironic? That was Adam's occupation. Gardener. He was supposed to take care of the garden. And now Jesus comes back as the second Adam, and she thinks he's a gardener. I don't know, man. Maybe it's just me, but I think that's amazing. He's showing us all these clues all over the place. Sir, if you've taken his body anywhere else, tell me and I will go. Mary, Jesus interrupted her and she recognizes his voice, turning to face him. She said, Rabboni, Aramaic for teacher. Jesus cautioned her, Mary, don't hold on to me now for I haven't yet ascended to God, my father. What do we think that means? Don't touch me yet because I have to go do something. What do I have to go do? I have to bring my blood into the heavenly tabernacle and I have to sprinkle my blood on the mercy seat <laughs> to close the cycle so that, Mary, you can have completed life and resurrected life and the same spirit that rose me from the dead is going to sit inside of you for the rest of your life and for eternity because you never die when you have Jesus, right? And then he says to Mary, he's not only my father and God, he's your father and your God. Sinner, Mary, prostitute, seven demons cast out of you, doesn't matter. He's your father and your God too. Anybody here feeling any shame? Take the cloak of shame off right now because nobody is beyond the reach of the Lord. And let's think about, it's not in here, but the road to Emmaus, right? Another one of these Similar situations where she sees somebody and she thinks it's the gardener, and then he reveals himself to her. Well, they're on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, sorry. Two disciples, it says, right? I believe it could have been a husband and a wife, not just two men. They were going to their home, and they're walking on the road, and all of a sudden this stranger comes along, and they start talking. And I won't go through all of it, but he reveals to them secrets, but they don't know who he is, right? And they bring him into their house, and they sit down, and they have a meal, Meal, remember? Pick the fruit, have communion. It says he took the bread and he broke it and he blessed it. And when he broke the bread and blessed it, their eyes were, and they knew it was him. Same thing, a meal. I'm telling you, man, start your day with communion. It'll help you. All right, so now I'm going to get into Hebrews. Don't shut your brain off. <laughs> people think Hebrews is too hard to follow, but uh, it's really, it's an awesome gift for us. I'm seeing people take pictures, and I'm happy to send you the slides, right? So all you have to do is give us your email, and I'll email you the slides if you want. And then eventually they'll be up on the website. All right, so let's just let's kind of like tie this all together. Because there's, um, 
right? If we're just honest and you start reading through the Old Testament, it can feel like a slog when you get into Leviticus and Exodus. Like, why does God think it's so important for all these details in there? And, and obviously, if it's in the Bible, it's important. But we're in this new covenant now, right? That's what he said. This is the blood of the new covenant that I'm making in my blood. All those old things that were there for a reason, but now you have the new thing that you have. It doesn't invalidate the Old Testament. It's symbolic for us. It's a teacher to us. But another comparison I use often, if you just picture those old rockets, right, when, um, when they were putting up, I like what Karen Wheaton did. This is pretty cool. She was talking like this. I guess I can't do it. Uh, they put those old rockets up, and th this would be the part that had all the fuel on it, and this would be the part that was going to keep going, right? Remember? And it would come up, and then this would just drift away, and this part would just keep going. So this is like the old law, the Old Testament, that was there for a purpose to get us somewhere, but now we're living in this new dispensation. So you don't have to eat kosher anymore, right? You know that? It says that in the New Testament. You don't have to eat kosher anymore. There's other parts of that ceremonial law that were there for a reason that are not, but don't throw the Old Testament out. Still want Psalm 91? How about you? Psalm 23. There's plenty in there that we need. So you get it? So when we look at Hebrews, we're getting this awesome window into what the symbolism meant. That is not always easy for us to figure out ourselves. It says, so Christ now has become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He's entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven. See, we were just talking about this, right? He's entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. What did he do? With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Whew. That's worth dwelling on, isn't it? Hebrews 9, 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption. He sprinkled his blood, the pure, spotless blood of the lamb, onto the holy place in heaven, the, the mercy seat in heaven. Verse 13, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Ah, but um, just think how much more. The blood of Christ will pur purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. So, you know, we all make mistakes, right? And there's an accuser of the brethren. So every day you have to make a choice. Which voice am I going to listen to? A choice for the voice. Which voice? The accuser of the brethren who's going to criticize all your mistakes or are you going to listen to what the Word of God says? Yes, you make mistakes, but I still love you anyway. It's not a condition of love. You can come in under my mercy, under my blood. I don't want you to keep sinning because he told the woman, right, and caught in adultery, go and sin no more. He's not in favor of us sinning, but we're the ones that get hurt when we're sinning. So stopping that is an awesome plan. That's a good strategy. You need his help to do that. You need his help. We need deliverance to break off those yokes that try to hold us down. But that's his goal. He wants us to live abundant, productive, victorious lives. So, you know, the writer here is saying, just think how much more the blood of Christ. If the blood of bulls and goats did it in the Old Testament, think now you have his blood, the spotless lamb going to purify your conscience. That's that, that ability to stop listening to the accuser from those sinful deeds so we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And you might be thinking, well, this is an Easter message, and Easter's not for two more weeks. I want you to be thinking about it now, <laughs> right? Lent was for 40 days before the, the eventual celebration. And I have to be honest, compared to Christmas, Easter, resurrection, Passover is a way bigger deal than Christmas. Being born was important, but if he didn't come out of the grave, if he didn't live again, we would have no hope. That's why we have hope, because he rose again. So spend the next 14 days while, between now and those and two Sundays from now dwelling on this, meditating on this. It'll strengthen you against sin, I'll tell you what. It's like immune system strengthening your immune system when you study the Word of God and you have hope. Like, no, devil, you're a liar. Those things are not going to hold on to me anymore, everything you're accusing me of. And then later in Hebrews 9, it says, For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy, right? That was in Exodus when he made the copy. The other priests were only going into a copy of the one true, the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself, and he appeared before God on our behalf. Me? Really? Don't you remember all the dumb things I did, God? Yes, I do. 
and I'm still appearing to my Father on your behalf because I love you. <laughs> Me? I thought you were going to show a movie of all the dumb things I've ever done. No, I love you. I'm putting my blood on the mercy seat so you can be free. Whew. Verse 25, he didn't enter into heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began. But now what? Once for all time and for all people. It doesn't say that, but it says it otherwhere, other places. He has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Are you part of that many people group? Raise your hand. We're almost done. All right. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who eager, are eagerly waiting for him. I may meditate on that one, don't you think? He's not ready to hit us with a big fly swatter. He's going to give us a better life. He's going to give us the life he intended Adam and Eve to have in the garden before sin. All right, you got one more left in you? Let's stand, and we'll read this one out loud as we, uh, as we close the service. Man, you might want to read the book of Hebrews between now and Resurrection Sunday. It's powerful. And if you get stuck on something, email me, and uh, I'll be the Bible answer man. <laughs> Who believes in the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Yeah, there was a guy on the radio many years ago called the Bible Answer Man who was always ripping up on anybody who believed in the Holy Spirit for today. So we'll have the uh, sanctified version of that. I don't have all the answers, but I'll sure give it a try if you're confused about something. But oh, I just want to read this out loud together because the words just so gripped me. Um, I, this is from the Passion Bible, and it's, I would encourage you to read that one too, uh, that version. It says, and now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. You think about that for a minute. How do you run into his heart? I'll give you another crucifixion for, scene for me. Is It says they put a spear in his side, right, to make sure that he was really dead. They didn't break his bones. Well, they didn't just put it in his side. They were Roman soldiers. They put it in the side where his heart was because they knew if they wanted to make sure he was dead, they had to put the spear through his heart. So that created a hole in his heart. And blood and water ran out. But we run in. That's what it says. Now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. This is where we find strength and comfort. For he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time. What is that? An un Say that a little louder, would you? An un How many have unshakable hope? Need more? Ask for more. Lord, I want more hope right now. Download a big deposit of more hope in my heart right now because you said it's unshakable right here in your word, and you're not a liar. And now, can we read this out loud together? Can you bear with me? We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat. Which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold and where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone in before us. Wow. Thank you, Brian Simmons, for the Passion Bible. Let me tell you. I was just like on the floor with this one. Because we get to run into his heart. And then I've been on boats most of my life. And I'm picturing my anchor, no matter how bad it is up on the surface where my boat is rocking really bad, my anchor is fastened onto the mercy seat. I got a straight direct connection to the mercy seat where he is. I'm going to read it one more time. We have this certain hope, like a strong, unbreakable anchor, holding my soul to God himself. My anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold. That means the holy of holies and where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone in before to sprinkle his, sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Lord, we thank you for your blood, that perfect blood, that blood covenant that you made with us. You laid down your life. Hmm. Face the fear. It says he sweated drops of blood in the garden took on all the sin of the whole world because you loved me 
I can't believe it in the natural, but I believe it by faith that you would love me that much that you would do that for me because I don't think I deserved it, but you do. And I receive it by faith. Can you say that? I receive your forgiveness by faith. I receive your blood on the mercy seat of my heart because you said my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that you reside inside of me. You don't have to say this part. So, Lord, we don't want to defile our temples as we stand here today before you as flawed people. Nobody here is perfect. We all need more of your strength and more of your power, more of your presence. You, you didn't commend David for being perfect, but you said he was a man after your heart. So I pray over every man and woman in here today and anybody listening that we would be men and women after your heart. And even though we might go off the road sometimes and, and fall in ditches, that we get ourselves back up and be after your heart again, that we would repent and ask for forgiveness and, and be accountable to other believers that can keep us iron sharpening iron towards one another and just purging stuff out of our life that may be slowing us down from fully serving you the way you want us to. And, Lord, we just thank you as we enter into this awesome blood covenant Passover season that you give us new insight new revelation of better and, and more powerful ways that we can live our lives to give glory to you through everything we do. And everybody said, amen, in Jesus' name. trisha has got a word. Don't go. So I just want to close with this scripture that I love in Zechariah 9, 11. And uh, it says, because of the blood of your covenant, I set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. And that word hope there means expectation. And it says, even today I declare that I will restore double to you. So that's the power of our blood covenant because we have an inheritance in him. It doesn't matter, you know, like what your current situation is. We're in covenant. It's not contractual. It's a covenant that we have with him. Deliverance for your family. Restoration in your finances. Yeah. We have a blood covenant. And that's the portion. That's the power that we stand upon. So, Lord, we just thank you today. Even as we hear the word of your about blood covenant, you are setting prisoners free. We are not captives. We are free people in Christ in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, you are restoring double. Lord, you're restoring things that we never even thought we can have because you love us and you're a good, good God. So, Lord, we thank you for the blood. Yes. Just just picture, I remember reading about John G. Lake and, and this guy flowed in such powerful yeah. healings and deliverances and signs and wonders. And the doctors put the bubonic plague on his hand and they put it under a microscope and he had such revelation of the power of the blood it died the bubonic plague you see that see but we have to it's that revelation uh, martin released that that god is releasing that revelation and we have that in us we don't not trying to get it it's just revelation so we bless you and if you need prayer you know we, nope we're, we're what we're, we have a prophetic team here today that will prophesy if, if, if you want a word from the Lord, and they will give instruction. Amen. I just want to ask anybody, if, if you've never received the Lord, I just want to give you an opportunity to receive him right now because the word of God is so powerful, and there's so much life in it. And, and it's a decision that we have to make, right? God doesn't force himself in. Maybe you've seen that old picture where he's standing at the door and he's knocking, but there's no handle on the outside of the door because you have to open the door. So there's a chance somebody here doesn't know the Lord, that you never accepted him in your life. So we're going to just say a prayer out loud together, okay? Church, you're going to say it with me? Let's do that. We can close our eyes, okay? Let's just close our eyes. Say, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive me. I've heard good news today. I've heard news that you died for my sin. I don't know how you would do it but you love me in spite of my sin. And I know I can't save myself. So I ask you to come in and save me. I repent of my sin. I know I can't save myself. So I need your power to live in me from this day forward. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Open my eyes to your word. Open my heart to your love. And give me the strength to serve you the rest of the days of my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel better now. I hope somebody else does too. If you never said that prayer before, 
and you said it today for the first time and you meant it, this would be a really good time to come to the altar. Just come down. You may have came with a friend. They'll bring you up. If not, we say bless you. Have an awesome day, and we'll see you next time the doors are open.